<laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Judging from the looks of it, you need a bubble bath. <laughs> They're having fun over there across the way. It's a beautiful morning. This afternoon, I hope you all have a nice, cool place to go. So uh, stay as cool as you possibly can over the next few days. It's not supposed to be very nice. That would be worthy. For those of you watching online, we welcome you as well. Thanks for joining us this morning. If you haven't already, say hi to us in the comments so that you, we know that you're here. Um, our Bible study continues. We are nearing the end. So this is week eight of a 10-week series. Um, today's worship, uh, service is, our sermon is titled Journey to Betrayal. So you can kind of take from that what you can start taking from it and then we'll listen and hear what, what uh, God is going to remark about that. But we'll watch that episode this Wednesday night at 7 and then on September 7th. See, now I'm thinking we're, today is, you know, the 25th, so that means next week is September, right? No, not Saturday, but Sunday is. So I was a week ahead. Our men's breakfast then is two weeks from yesterday on September 7th at 9 o'clock. Now, next week, Mark's like, are you sure? It's like, yeah, there's what, 31 days, right? No. <laughs> um, then that evening, uh, after we transform from a restaurant into a movie theater, we'll be showing up at Almighty. Uh, movie starts at 6, doors open at 5, I almost said gates open at 5.30. <laughs> Watch too many sports sometimes, I think. But doors will open at 5.30. Concessions and movie are free. Concessions are free as long as they last. Once they're gone, they're gone, but I've never seen us run out, so <laughs> take that for what you will. <laughs> but this is a good movie. Um, if you haven't seen it, uh, there will be a trailer for those of you watching online at the in the at the end of the worship music, so you can watch that there. And then, uh, for those of us here, we'll get to watch it after at the end of the service. But just a, a quick note to remind everyone that we do show movies like this from time to time, designed not so much for its theological training but for its ability to invite people to ask questions. And it gives us an opportunity to have those spiritual conversations with people we might not necessarily have that opportunity with. Then the following Saturday, we'll get to Orange Track Racing. We are down to the last three races of the season. Uh, we'll be racing at, with registration 930, racing at 10, and then uh, we are only three races away from retooling the track, too, so we look forward to that as well. And then very quickly, on September 15th, we will be, I'm sorry, let me back up one. It's not September 10th, it's September 14th for Orange Track Racing. It was right up there, it's wrong in here. Thanks for the pen burn. You're welcome. And then, so the following day, see this makes more sense on the 15th on Sunday, because there's not like a four day, a five day between Saturday and Sunday, we will begin our next sermon series based on season four of The Chosen. And with that, we will be watching each episode the following, each, that Wednesday. So uh, first episode sermon will be on Sunday the 15th, and then on the 18th, we'll begin watching this series, and I know everybody's been waiting for it, so be sure to join us for that. If you're watching online, there will also be a link to our website, gracetree.church forward slash messages. If you get, just go out to the website, click on messages in the upper right hand corner, the playlist is right at the top. You can click that and listen to that so that you can uh, worship along with us. With that, we can now slow down just a little bit, take a little bit of a pause from our busy lives, and step into worship. Father God, we thank you for this day. And Father, while we know it will be hot today, we pray that everyone will have a cooler day, a place to go where they can stay comfortable. Father, we thank you for this message that we are about to hear today. 
this journey to betrayal. But this morning as we start, Father, let us hear the words that you have for us. Let us start uh, here with Mark chapter 1. In Jesus' name, amen. So our call to worship is from Mark 1, verses 4 and 9. It says, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all of the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We're all very familiar with this passage. But think of it like this, and just to kind of start this out, we are, as Americans, we were all born here, or naturalized, as my mother-in-law was, and became American citizens. But it's through baptism that we show an outward sign of how we have been born again and are citizens of God's kingdom. See, by repenting, we are adopting God's perspective, heaven's perspective on our sins, and we're turning from them. John's plain lifestyle was reflected, certainly in his clothing, and we all think wool is itchy, try camel's hair. <laughs> and his food. Mark likes to tease me a little bit when it comes to men's breakfast, because he talks about peppers and onions. Food. John ate locusts. I'm sure with the honey it was a little sweeter. But he lived a very simple life. And he, you could almost say he was a simple and if you were to ask him unworthy man who was pointing us specifically then, the Israelites, to Jesus. And it would be Jesus who would come and baptize us, his followers, with the Holy Spirit. Something that was promised long ago. In fact, if we go all the way back to Joel chapter 2, verse 28, it says, Then after doing all these those things, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Baptism was and still is an outward sign that we've decided to change our lives by turning away from our sins and believing us in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And I saw an article uh, this morning uh, before service uh, Russell Crowe is trying to decide on a church to go to, and he is on his path towards baptism. Funny. For him, for us, it's a decision. It's a departure from the cultural norm. And that goes all the way back to John's time, Jesus' time, where it was a radical departure from Jewish custom for people to be baptized as a sign of repentance. Jesus was baptized to identify with us as sinners whom he'd come to save so that he might be distinguished as the Messiah, the Son of God. This is but the beginning of a journey where he would teach, he would 
show by example. Give it love. And ultimately, be betrayed. Father God, as we hear the message that you've given to Pastor Mark this morning, may our hearts be humbled by your words. May we see the love that you have for us May we understand that it wasn't just Judas's betrayal, but our sin that is also betrayal. Open our ears, open our minds, and open our hearts. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Terry. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, I got to tell you, you women really outdid yourselves today. And as I was sitting back here thinking, I, was, I looked over at the temptation tray over there. It brings a whole new meaning to the term feeding the 5,000. So, Jesus did it in numbers of people. You're doing it in calories over there on that tray. I, I got that one figured out, so I have to stay on this side of the room. I did. Well, you know, yes. As a matter of fact, yes. A very large problem. Uh, anyway, so wow, we're, we're like uh, almost to the end of our journey here in the Bible mini series. Uh, we're in episode eight is what we're talking about today. So in this section of the mini-series, it's really tied together. So six, seven, and eight, as if you were here Wednesday night, you heard me say that. Six, seven, and eight are kind of tied together in here. And basically it's from the beginning to the trail of Jesus' time here on earth. So we started off with the, with the birth of Christ and, and follow through all the way out here until betrayal. So uh, to recap a little bit about this, in episode 6, we heard Jesus telling Peter in his fishing boat that they were going to change the world and change the world from what it was. And the next two episodes then that we saw show us how they set about to do just that. And moreover, it began to show how Jesus' presence then changed the course of history and literally the course of history. If you think about it, one person has had more impact on the world than any other person, and that is Jesus. And it's absolutely incredible. So in this then, we see Jesus feed the multitudes, he healed the leper, he and the paralyzed man. We hear radical teachings of the Son of Man in stark contrast to what the Jewish community had heard throughout history. And up until this point, you know, it was all centered on the Mosaic laws and, and obedience to the Mosaic laws. But it also begins to shed light on how the chosen representatives of God then, the Jewish High Council, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, Sadducees, were all corrupted. And they were corrupted by power and greed. So the will of God and his people was cast aside for their greed and their power. And that had corrupted the very ones that God had entrusted to represent him to the people at the time. So the Jewish community for literally hundreds of years had really been caught in a trap of the high council and their teachings. And their teachings were all about adherence to the law. And we need to look upon this kind of from a different perspective. Jesus was simply restoring the will of God to his people, God's will then. So they were actually finding out what the will of God looked like. So then the revolution that I talked about a couple of weeks ago comes into play because this is a complete departure from anyone or anything God had done or sent to the people before this. So Jesus was a complete departure for the Jewish community and so therefore, it was kind of a revolution. It was something completely different than what they were used to. 
And so God sent Jesus because man himself could not be trusted to bring unity back to God. So have you ever thought about it from that perspective? See, Jesus was coming simply to restore the will of God back to the people, the word of God back to the people, the relationship of God back to the people. So Jesus came to earth, born of a virgin, never been done before, or since, walked amongst the very people he was here to save, God's presence in the midst of the people. So what that did was it gave them a living example of God among us and how to be a godly people in an ungodly world. And so when we think about that, that is really, really something. That's a departure from anything we'd had before. Now God sent his commandments, which were sent to the people out of love. And if you take a look, take a look at the commandments that are broken out, the first four are your relationship with God. The last six are how you are to relate to everyone else and how to be that godly person and how to show that love to others. So I borrowed that from Dr. Jeremiah. So I thought that's cool. <laughs> so uh, God gave him this living example of God among us in Jesus and how to be ungodly in a how to be godly in an ungodly world. What the will of God was and how far that the people had strayed from the will of God was what Jesus was doing. He was restoring that knowledge of what that will was all about. So Jesus' ministry starts with being cleansed, baptized in the Jordan River. So that was a living example of what God was calling all, all his people to do. So then God sends the spirit of holiness upon Jesus and declares to all present, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And when we think about the call to worship this morning in Mark, and we, we hear those words coming down, and we see Jesus being baptized, and everyone is there to repent of their sins and their sinful nature, be baptized and be clean by John the Baptist, right? Well, you've got to think about that. This was done simply for Jesus, for those present, so they could see and have no doubts about who Jesus was and who God had sent. This is my son of whom I am well pleased. Okay, so there's a question that's no doubt just popping up in your heads right now. If Jesus is indeed sinless, why did he need to be baptized? Ooh, everybody else was getting baptized because they were repenting of their sins and their sinful nature. Jesus didn't have a sinful nature, did he? He didn't sin. So why did he need to be baptized? And I knew that question was running through all of your minds this morning, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the answer is really easy, but it's difficult. And it comes in several parts. So part number one, Jesus was born of the flesh of Mary. Even though it was a virgin birth, it was still of the flesh, and as such, born into sin. Now, this is not to say that Jesus sinned, that's something completely different. It's entirely different. But he was born into sin because he was born of flesh. Okay? Point number two, Jesus is fulfilling his role as the obedient son of God by practicing the required righteousness of submitting to God's will to repent. In other words, to live in the world wholeheartedly devoted to God. So he's being baptized as a sign of his obedience to the will of God. God's will was that everyone would be baptized of the water and of the spirit, which he later on talked to Nicodemus about, which we see in the scriptures. Point number three, God wanted him to be the example by which all must follow, being baptized the water and the spirit. This was so Jesus could lead by example to all that who saw him. He was the living example of God's will for man. And so we need to understand that because Jesus was sent to earth for that very reason, to be God's representative, to represent God to all of the people. And I want you hear me saying this all the time, all of the people, not just the Jewish people, all of the people are God's people. 
the Jewish people were God's chosen people, going back to the times of Moses. But all people are God's people. Thus began the ministry of Jesus, and it was almost a non-starter. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. John knew Jesus and recognized him for who he was even before he was born. John recognized who Jesus was. And you're going, well, how's that work? Let's take a look. Luke 1, 39 through 45. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city in Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as I heard the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told to her from the Lord. See, John knew who Jesus was before he was born. He leapt in his mother's womb. But did you notice what else happened here? So, in case you guys didn't know, Elizabeth is John the Baptist's mother. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's clarify all that so you knew what was going on. So John the Baptist isn't even born yet, but at the sound of Mary's voice coming through, he leapt for joy because he knew Jesus was there in his very presence. Amazing. Love it. So I want you to hold on to what we just heard about in that pack of passage in there. Elizabeth, John's mother then, in the presence of Mary, the Holy Spirit came upon her, and she knew immediately who Jesus was. And she questioned Mary, why would Mary come to her? And also here then is John later in the presence of Jesus, questioning Jesus why he would want to be baptized by John. John himself was hesitant to baptize Jesus. John, aware that Jesus wasn't just any other person coming to repent, to confess his sins, to confess his sins and repent. Oh, he, he was sinless. Why are you coming to baptize? Why, why are you coming to me to baptize you? You should be baptizing me. Where are his exact words? So I need to be baptized by you, but you are coming to me. Matthew 3, 14. Jesus answered to John as in the reluctant is instructive. Both in answering our question and revealing an important aspect of Matthew's theology. So this is how Matthew writes it. Let it be so, for it is fitting in this way for us to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, I am here doing the will of my Father, and I am fulfilling his will in this baptism. This is a weighty answer. And it considers, it has two different words in here in the way that Matthew did it. Fulfill and righteousness. Fulfill all righteousness. So first, righteous in Matthew refers to a whole person's behavior that aligns with God's will, God's nature, and his coming kingdom. So when Matthew is writing this, because if you look in, in Paul and his writing and his epistles in here, in his letters that he writes, his righteousness is talking about something different. It's talking about a way of life and a life of piety, which is a little bit different. So Matthew's uses is more typical of the Old Testament sense of heart. Where your heart is, then uh, your actions will follow. And that becomes then deep and faithful obedience to God. So that's what Matthew's talking about. He is to fulfill all righteousness from the very heart of himself. And Jesus is showing himself to be the good and obedient son who does God's will perfectly. This is a very, very important concept from the point of baptism all the way through betrayal. So, 
we need to make sure we understand that Jesus' whole life as he presents himself in his ministry is showing himself to be the good and obedient son who does God's will perfectly. Okay? So what happens when Jesus comes up out of the water from being baptized? A voice booms down from heaven. This is my son whom I am well pleased. In other words, God is saying he is fulfilling my will here. And that's what makes God happy. Go back to the Ten Commandments. What do we want to do to make God happy? The first four are how we treat God and how God is with us. The rest are how we treat everyone else. That makes God happy. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts and thou shalt nots. It's about a relationship of love between you and God and you and God's people. How to be godly in an ungodly world. That's what that whole thing's about. That's what all the laws were based on. They kind of got corrupted in the process by man, not God. So our second point is we must understand what repentance means. So today, the word repentance often evokes that image of somebody on a street corner with a sandwich sign that reads, the end is near, or hanging one up here and holding it up on it. I remember a few years back, there was a <clears throat> preacher from a certain Baptist church that would stand down on the corner, and I, boy, I'm telling you what, he was raining down on people, screaming at the top of his lungs. And, you know, uh, when I lived in Chicago, there... <laughs> There was always somebody down there with the end is near sign somewhere down there. And it was really something. But biblical repentance is a little bit broader and tuned differently. The call to repent for the kingdom is near, which is in Matthew 3, 2, and 4 and 17. That is an urgent invitation then to reorient our values and our habits, our loves, and our thinking and our behavior according to a different understanding. And that understanding is going to be one that is rooted in the revelation of God's nature and in his coming reign. Okay? One is of a sinful nature. The other is to say, hey, we want you to repent. It means we want you to change from your current behavior patterns the things that you're doing. Now, we want you to stop doing those realign yourself to what God wants you to be doing and in short repentance becomes being a disciple I want you to repent I want you to become a disciple I want you to be a student of God so when we talk about repent in Matthew's gospel in here that's what he's talking about change from who you are I mean he was a tax collector low life in Jewish society he changed to become a disciple. So he changed all those things. His behaviors, his habits, his loves, his understanding, and his thinking changed to align himself with the will of God and what the will of God was for his life. And so when we're being called to repent from a biblical, biblical perspective, this is what we're being called to do, is to change into being a student of God's will and aligning our lives accordingly. Our repentance necessarily includes this whole action, but the sense of dedicating himself to follow God's will fully on earth is what Jesus was doing there. A little bit different concept. But. Now, the baptism of Jesus should now make sense. Yes, he was without sin, but he was doing these things to align himself with the word of God and to call others to become disciples. Ooh, gonna change the world, right? This is what it's all about. So, on with the story. Now, Jesus is clean, right? He's been baptized, righteous, fully committed to doing the will of God. So he's up and out of the water. God says, yeah, good job. Next, we find Jesus approaching Simon Peter, who's in his boat, he's very frustrated, and we all know that sailor language, right? So he, I'm sure he wasn't too happy. He'd been out fishing all night long, caught absolutely nothing, been there, done that. And Jesus starts getting very real. He hops in Peter's boats and he tells him to cast out his nets. 
And of course, Peter wants to argue with him. Here comes this stranger hopping in his boat. Hey, what do you think you're doing? And he, I've been fishing all night long. There's nothing out here to be caught. But what does Peter do? Sets out away from the shore, casts out his nets, and he catches so many fish, his boat is about to sink. So then he calls for James and John to come over and help him. And it is here that Jesus tells Simon Peter that he will call him Cephas from now on. So in some portions of the Bible, you see, you see the name Cephas in there. Well, Cephas means rock. And that's what he called Simon Peter. So he changed the name to Peter. So that's why we hear him instead of Simon. He is now called Peter, but he's also called Cephas. And he is the rock. And Jesus goes on to say, and upon this rock, I will build my church. So he is giving Simon Peter a new purpose for his life. And moreover, he is saying, I am going to make you the basis, the foundation for my church. We all know the story of the house that's built on the sand and built on the rock. So, he calls him Cephas, which is the rock. And here Jesus begins to choose the ones who are going to help him set that revolution into play to change the world. To change the world. So, throughout episode 7, we see the many miracles. We see all kinds of different things going on. Miracles that Jesus performed. He healed the paralytic. He healed the leper. He moves throughout the region, showing the people, not just the Jews, but Gentiles as well, what a godly person should be like. And this is what is meant by he was coming into all the world to make disciples of all men. Repentance, making disciples of all men. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. So, caring, compassion, empathy for those who are cast out by society and in their own communities. Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount, which is perhaps the most influential message ever delivered. Ever delivered. And this makes the Jewish ruling class then have cause for alarm because in the process of Jesus doing his good works for the people, the people are following him more than the religious leadership. They cannot refute his works or his words, so they try to disparage them instead, saying he calls demons to perform his miracles. So Jesus confronts the Pharisees as they're getting ready to stone a woman to death because she was accused of adultery, and instead Jesus teaches them a lesson about humility and grace. And compassion. He did it with using their own sins to show they're no better than any of the other person that they were wishing to stone to death. Let he who is out sin cast the first stone. And they all had to drop their stones. And then he says to the woman, where are your accusers? Where are your accusers to condemn you? I neither condemn you either. Go and sin no more. And he shows compassion. <clears throat> he shows grace. He shows mercy, which is the will of God for God's people. But the Pharisees, what did they want to do? They just wanted to stone her to death because the law says if you break the law, you get stoned. No grace. No mercy, no compassion, nothing, no love, no God's will. Okay. So they couldn't argue or refute what he said or did because he used their own law to show them it applies to all equally. In other words, you guys are just as guilty. So how can you pass judgment? This is a hard lesson for the rulers and it infuriates them because they know he's right. 
but they lose control every time he intervenes. Plot thickens. So this is very important for us to understand. Jesus was not wrong in anything he did or anything he said, but no one likes to have their wrongs presented to them especially when it's in front of the people that they're trying to have authority over. That's the big rub, if you will. They're threatened by his actions from a purely power standpoint, so in a very short period of time, Jesus has garnered a very large following, and word is quickly spreading throughout the entire region and beyond that the Messiah is here, a Savior is here. He's shaken up the world. He's revolutionary in what he's doing. I still think of the movie every time I hear that. Jesus Revolution. So the Jewish High Council thinks about this large and ever-growing threat to them. Threat to them. Instead of praising the fact that the Messiah was indeed here and embracing him for who he was. And instead they turned on him. Now, this is exactly why God sent Jesus, as I said earlier today. He was sent in spite of the leadership of the Jewish people. It was because they had replaced worshiping God with worshiping the law that he had to send Jesus. And they had become an idol to the Jewish high council, worshiping the law. That had become their idol. That is what was at the center of their lives. God wasn't at the center of their lives anymore. They receive power and wealth from the, import, uh, from the enforcement of the law. Jesus then sets that apart and tears it down because that's not what God's will is for the people. So Jesus continues his ministry and calls many, many more to follow him. He gave the message on the plane and feeds the 5,000, not the calories on the tray, but the 5,000 people. <laughs> He walks on water and he calls Peter to come out of the boat as a sign of faith and trust in Jesus. And everything's just fine. Everything's okay. Until Peter looks around and he sees the storm and he goes, oh, I'm in trouble. And immediately he starts to sink because he took his focus off of Jesus. And see, that whole thing, that whole thing, Focus, taking her focus off of Jesus, he would have died. He would have sank down and he would have drowned. S crept back into the storm of the world. That whole thing was a massive metaphor. Great thing. So what does Jesus do? He reaches down and he saves him. He pulls him up out of that water and puts him back in the boat. That's a foretelling for all of us to keep our eyes on Jesus. So Jesus saves Peter, calms the storm, and it was only then, it was only then that some of the disciples believed who he was and he could do what he said he could do. And then Jesus proceeds to Nazareth, his own hometown, and he is rejected by the people in his own hometown. And that becomes a glimpse of what was going to happen in the future on his journey to Jerusalem. So Pastor Terry's message last week was on Lazarus and Jesus bringing him back from death to life. And then word spread very quickly on that to the Jewish High Council, and they were getting very worried because now this guy's raising the dead back to life. So they're wanting to know, what is he going to do next? So they plotted to dispatch him. Now, dispatching him is a decent way of saying they were going to kill him. They were going to put him to death. And he, they wanted to put him to death before he could cause them any more problems. So, then Jesus comes to Jerusalem riding on a donkey on the indicator that the prophecy was being fulfilled through him and that the Messiah has indeed arrived. We find that in Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. 
humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 500 years before Jesus was born, this prophecy was written by Zechariah, and it was now being fulfilled through him. So again, during Jesus' ministry, over 300 prophecies were fulfilled through him. So how could the biblical scholars not see that this was indeed the long-awaited Messiah? They should rejoice, for salvation was at hand, right? Well, but in their humanness, they missed the point. In their humanness, they missed the opportunity. But then, where would we be today if they hadn't turned a blind eye? So they betrayed him with false charges, and Jesus was condemned not by what he had done, but simply because he was a threat to the Jewish council. See, Jesus went blameless to the cross. It wasn't for something he did wrong. It wasn't for something he said wrong. But it was simply because he was a threat to their power, threat to their wealth, threat to their control over the Jewish people. That was it. He went to the cross because of his commitment to God the Father to do the will of his Father completely to death. So that's why I started off with, here is my Son, which whom I am well pleased. He committed himself to doing the will of his Father, God's will above everything and anything else, all the way to death. That's righteousness. That's what Matthew was talking he was there to fulfill all of his all of his ministry was to fulfill that righteousness and he went to the cross could you do it could you go to the cross for god's will well i can't say i could i can't say i could the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak flesh is weak. Well, stay tuned. There's more to come. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity for gathering here together today. We thank you for the many blessings that you give us each and every day. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word, that we can study your word. We can look at it through the examples in this mini-series, in our music, in so many different ways that you've revealed your word and your purpose for us and your will for our lives. Lord, open our hearts today to understand and to receive that message and so that we can live it out each and every day. Father God, we love you, Lord, and we just praise you and thank you for all of the gracious things you do in our lives each and every day. In Jesus' name. meal we're about to share together is just a moment in time before that betrayal. Can you just see in the in the episode we watched. You know it's hard because I've watched the next episode <laughs> <laughs> again, and, and, and so they and Mark knows this. They just become like this, but. In it, whichever one it was, we know that Judas shared this meal with Jesus. But what we're going to see, or if we've already seen, regardless what it is, I see betrayal in the eyes of Judas because he thought he was just giving Jesus over to be questioned.
but what we can do is look to Christ and know that that action, that acceptance, that baptism, makes us children of God, residents of heaven, citizens of heaven. That's why we can take such solace when we share this meal. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Towards the end of the meal, he filled the cup once again. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. He also said, this is my blood shed for you the betrayal of man. Take and drink. Scripture reminds us as often as we do so, we're to do this until Christ's return. Body of Christ, look with me at me. The blood of Christ shed for you. Father, thank you that you've made a way because of our sins, because of our betrayal. And you've made this plan since eternity that lasts until eternity. That we can be made righteous in your eyes. Thank you for this gift in Jesus' name. and we went to a bicycle shop in Iowa City and we were coming home. We were on the interstate and I was in the fast lane passing a semi. Then the semi decided to push me off the interstate. Oh. And so I, I swear Jesus just took over and we were on the grass in the median passing the semi and we got back on the interstate right before the cables started again. Mm. Oh, wow. So praise God. <laughs> And you know, I wasn't even nervous. It was until afterwards, you know, that I realized that we could have died, but you know, God was there watching over us and he took care of us like he always does. And you know, you go through your life day after day and you don't think Jesus is with you, but yes, he is everywhere. So that's my praise for this morning. Yeah. So anyway, let's go to prayer. Father God, as it says in Psalms 92, one and two, it is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. As we come into your house today to praise you and honor you and lift up prayers and petition to you, we thank you for your mighty power, for your majesty is over all the earth. Your kingdom will reign forever. Glory be to the God Most High. Father, you never leave us or forsake us. Just when we think we are far from you, we may be in despair or caught up in the strife of life. You are there right beside us, walking with us or carrying, carrying us through this life. You are an amazing God, awesome in power and glory and honor. Psalms 27, 1 and 2. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You are the almighty God who has the power to save us from anything and everything. You have the power to heal our sickness, our disease, our infirmities, and our unbelief. Therefore, we lift up all who are online or here who have cancer or disease that, has, that as humans we think cannot be healed. We lift up our physical, our mental weakness to you, Father God, and we ask for strength of mind, body, heart, and soul to know and believe you are the one true God that can heal and break the chains that are holding us captive. Bring us out of the bondage that has infiltrated our bodies. Bring healing, Father, to all who are in need. Help them to know that they are loved by you. Help them to call on your name, for you are Yahweh Rapha, 
the Lord who heals. There is no other God. Father, I lift up Lynette's family to you. Her mom and dad are both failing, and we ask that the blood of Jesus wash over them. Give them all peace in their hearts and minds, healing to their bodies. Give the family discernment to know how to help their parents, how to speak to them. Give them courage and energy to help their parents through this time in their lives. May they all find you right there with them as each day unfolds. Father, we lift up Mary to you for healing of her knees and joints. As she sees the doctor this week, give them wisdom to know exactly how to help her. Please comfort her and take her pain away. Give her strength, courage, and energy to face each new day. Father God, I, I call on you and I ask for prayers for, for Trey's mother. I, I ask for healing for his mother, Father God. She's got COVID and I just pray that you will walk with her through this and bring her back to healing in Jesus' name. Father, we continue prayers for our children and grandchildren coming into their lives, put children or put Christian people in their path to show them who you are, that they may worship you and follow your Ten Commandments. As the children go back to school this year, may our school boards and city and governments in each state bring you back into the schools where the children may learn your commands. Know that you are the way, the truth, and the life. For the way of the world is destruction to their bodies, minds, and souls. Father, we need a revival of hearts all across this nation. I pray it happens this year, Father God. Please protect our schools from the evil one who seeks to kill and destroy the innocent. Thank you, Jesus. I also pray for protection for our homeless population. Feed them, house them, and give them hope for each new day. And Father God, there are fires still raging out of control in the western part of the United States. Wyoming, Montana, California, just to name a few. As in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, it states, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Therefore, by prayer and petition, we are asking for you to bring the rain, sleet, or snow to drown out the fires, Break the power of the fires and stamp them out. And we ask this all in your mighty and precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that awesome prayer. That's my opportunity to get fed along with us, so thank you. Uh, this brings us to our end of our online portion of our service today. Uh, we thank you for joining us online, and we ask that, you know, if you're able to, come and join us in presence in here so you can uh, help us uh, get rid of the calories on the tray <laughs> over there uh, and just join in the spirit and, you know, of fellowship with us in here. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you today just as we are. We're sorry for our sins. We repent of our sins today, and we ask for your forgiveness. In your holy name, we forgive others for what they have done against us. We ask that they would be blessed and that forgiveness would reign. We renounce Satan and the evil spirits and all of their works, and we give our entire selves to you, Lord Jesus. Come into our hearts today. We make you our Lord and Savior. Lord, we ask that you would heal us. You would change us. You would strengthen us in body, soul, and spirit. Come, Lord Jesus, cover us with your precious blood. Fill us full of your Holy Spirit. Anoint us and appoint us to become your disciples, your godly people to an ungodly world. We praise you and thank you, Lord Jesus, in your precious and holy name. As we come into our song, the time of songs, if you have the opportunity, we have the link in the message today, and uh, hopefully you'll catch a little bit more of God's message in the